Alexandra Harrison is an expert in the renewable energy construction space, directly involved with construction of projects over 600 megawatts, including solar and wind power and battery storage. Alexandra has enjoyed working with future generations of young people as an educator for over a decade. She dreams of a world where emission reduction and decarbonisation would be the norm for sustainable living. It is my absolute honour to uh, present today. My presentation is going to be focusing on decarbonising and in particular looking at the mining sector in Australia and also at the, um, the steel manufacturing sector and what is happening. So in, uh, as we all know, we've had uh, COP26 recently. Uh, COP26 in particular had a focus on action and the, that action was looking at organisations, but obviously mostly um, governments committing to medium term goals and metrics uh, that are actually able to be reported and recorded. Uh, that in itself was, uh, that was, I believe, uh, quite a big step coming from uh, COP21 and the Paris Agreement. Moving on from that, uh, I'll also be talking about the corporate response of Australian industry in light of um, Australian government practice and responses to date um, at a very high level there. And also, a real, um, I'm going to touch on power generation transition within Australia with some really good metrics that came out just yesterday released um, and that following that on with what the mining sector is currently doing and then what is um, metal manufacturing looking like and what is the future of that and these are as you'll see very shortly these are actually quite pertinent um, industries to be talking about as they specifically are considered um, hard to abate industries meaning that they are very big uh, fossil fuel suckers or consumers. All right. So where are we up to? In Australia, um, we have interim emissions goals. Uh, unfortunately, from a federal government perspective, we have a very weak position as a country. However, from a state government, we have a better position. The true factor is that the Australian industry at large and the corporate response needs to be the driver as our government itself is very acts very safely and actually lags and this is due to a long history that Australia has with the coal with coal mining um, which in fact has actually left us behind and is causing us to lose our manufacturing and our shipping of our minerals and resources overseas at our lowest value in our supply chain. I just want to quickly go around uh, and look at what the what is happening in Australia. Uh, what, what we will find and what is most um, encouraging is what Tasmania is doing. So at present, there are only two states in Australia or territories in Australia, in Australia that are that have legislation in place that are targeting net zero emissions and decarbonising. And those are Tasmania that already that had in 2015 already reached its net zero targets. It has legislation in place, but further to that, as of mid next year, it is already committed to a 200% um, renewables and net zero target, meaning that it will actually be going negative in terms of its um, fossil fuel consumption. So. That's, that is good for Australia, but unfortunately, it's not the largest populated state in Australia. So its impact would have been a lot better, say, if we had swapped it with well, New South Wales being a much larger um, state, highly populated, large amounts of um, industry there. Uh, the other one is the ACT they also have uh, legislation in place. The rest of our states, um, and I'll leave you to reflect on this image at, um, in your own time, but the rest of the states, the state governments themselves and territory governments are not comfortable with um, committing to legislation. However, there are some uh, 
conversations about targets towards um, reduction in emissions uh, in terms of the 2030 uh, medium term goals. Moving on from there, um, as I was saying at the very start of the uh, of my presentation, uh, just recently, Renew Economy, which is a, a, a leader in the renewable space and for reporting and, um, and communicating what is happening in Australia, uh, yesterday published that we in Australia have reached 60% uh, power generation from renewable sources as a yesterday. Uh, that includes rooftop, that includes um, large scale infrastructure and um, the, so we're talking about solar, we're talking about uh, high, uh, hydro, wind and uh, some other that are in battery storage. Those are the, the main ones that Australia uses. Obviously there's a couple of others, but not really this, they're not part of, they're very minor in terms of uh, reportability. Uh, so AMO is the Australian energy market operator and it's Australia's um, go-to organisation. It's the, the market leader and driver that determines what or which generators in Australia. When I talk about generators, I'm talking about um, power plants. Um, and so there is a currently a plan in place where AMO has committed that as of early 2040, all of the coal-fired power plants and power generators in Australia are going to be decommissioned, uh, which of course has a huge bearing on the fact that we are working towards net zero emissions by 2050. The composition of the replacement uh, power generations is going to consist primarily of wind and solar, followed uh, as well as the pumped hydrogen. We've got grid scale battery and, and, and thermal generation. But the new one that's coming onto the market that uh, we would have seen a lot in the media would have been about hydrogen as a renewable, um, a green source of energy. Okay, so industries that I was talking about earlier, the hard to abate industries, as I was saying, hard to abate just means that these particular industries are heavily reliant on fossil fuels. So the transport industry, meaning these large vehicles that um, logistics that we rely on for transporting our goods and our services, um, manufacturing, especially large and um, large scale manufacturing, whether it is metal manufacturing, whether it is tech, the, the large style, uh, scale textiles and any type of that um, commercial grade manufacturing. Those are very heavily reliant on fossil fuels because they are very hungry for things like fast and high heat um, and uh, their big energy sucks. Uh, at the time of their peak production. And obviously the one that is most commonly um, referred to is mining, which we generally, when we think mining, we think trucks, we think things being taken out of the ground. So generally people will either think metal mining or uh, coal mining. Today, we're gonna focus on metal mining because I, I very optimistically and truly believe that Coal mining is um, a thing of history it, and we just need to get on board with that. Um, now, moving on from, so from there, let's look at how power generators and the mining sector interla um, interface. So at the moment, the mining sector is grid connected generally or is uh, diesel powered. Uh, those are both your fossil fuel uh, power generators. What the Australian landscape is doing is it's actually transitioning and there are a lot of microgrids coming on that are taking, uh, that are 
generating their own power through renewable sources, the two primary sources of renewables that are being integrated into Australian mine sites at the moment are wind and uh, solar, primarily solar, because solar has a very, very cheap um, life uh, yeah, lifetime of maintenance uh, in terms of per watt uh, construction. It is very cost effective. Wind, on the other hand, has an extraordinarily uh, high cost of um, construction as an onlay. It has um, a lot more moving parts. Moving parts means a lot of attention needs to be uh, given to the maintenance aspect of the generator. So generally speaking, um, solar is a, a more preferred option. It's very, whilst it's not completely true, it, it almost has that appeal of a set and forget. Um, the, the other thing to um, consider is at present, mining organisations also have very large um, requirements for heavy machinery and heavy vehicles. These require a lot of diesel to provide the requisite torque in order to get the works completed. Because at the end of the day, these are still um, organisations that are for profit. So they don't want to be reliant on a, um, on a safe, slow input of power. They need that really high level of power, whether that is mining or whether that is the manufacture, especially the metals manufacturing. So from that, if we look at corporate action that is being done in Australia at the moment, I'm going to present to you um, two clients that um, UV Australia works directly with. So the company I work with, it has um, is their headquarters is based in uh, Europe and their portfolio of uh, wind is quite extensive. Um, in Australia, we have just recently commissioned our first um, wind turbines that I've been directly involved with. And that was an extraordinarily successful and um, ambitious goal at the start for at this time last year, which now we are really impressed with how smoothly it has come across. Uh, in doing so, we have effectively um, allowed an entire, uh, we have been part of encouraging an entire region within Western Australia to be um, off grid. Into, so it, it will run its own microgrid and it is no longer requ requisite to be um, on the, the NSP, the uh, National uh, as part of the NSP, the National Service Providers um, Large Scale Grid for the State of Western Australia. And the other projects that uh, I am involved with, one of them is at BHP. Now, BHP at the moment has, um, yeah, as of the October this year, or September this year, had committed to supporting industry to develop its technologies and pathways in order to have 30% reductions in its intensity of um, integrated steel manufacturing. One of the projects that, the project that I'm working on at the moment is the Southern Cross Energy Network, which is located at Nickel West mine site in Northern Goldfields of Western Australia. That particular project is a microgrid that's a, it's a hybrid microgrid consisting of solar and battery storage, which in effect will take, uh, will create a reliable um, uh, source of power to the entire Nickel West mining, um, the two sites combined. And it will also be able to, uh, at times of peak generation, actually on sell any of its additional power. I highly recommend um, following that if you can in the social medias, that's going to be a really exciting project. Another client that we've worked with um, is Rio Tinto. So we, we have, um, we're working with a mine site in Northern Queensland in Weeper. 
Um, but they also have a lot of mine sites elsewhere um, in Australia, predominantly in Western Australia and in Queensland throughout. Again, the, uh, the projects are generally hybrid, off-grid or microgrids. Uh, they consist of a solar portion that feeds into a battery storage uh, in order to provide a reliable, um, low irritants supply of power. The low, when we speak low irritants, we mean obviously when it's um, dark or when it's overcast, because both of those um, are going to cause um, a very poor reliance on solar input. So Rio Tinto, again, early this year, had committed to steel decarbonisation of its investment pathways. It was committing to 30% reduction by 2030 in its carbon intensive steel making partnerships, namely its supply chain. So its on selling of its raw materials were, um, that's what they were measuring. It was also working directly on carbon neutral steel making by 2050. And the last, organization I want to highlight is Fortescue Metals and um, what is happening there. So Fortescue Metals has recently published a lot in terms of it's very um, it's very eager to to see research and development in the Australian space become world leaders uh, in the renewable space and in green steel manufacturing. They're, targets were for 100% carbon neutral uh, of its steel manufacturing by 2040. As well as that, green steel with uh, a 97% high purity that uses arc, electric arc furnaces in place of coal and, um, and fossil fuel uh, power generators in order to run its furnaces. Obviously, these three organisations that I've um, brought to your attention, they're all miners, but they all feed into the steel manufacturing. One of Australia's major steel manufacturing organisations is Blue Scope Steel. Now, Blue Scope Steel intends to reduce its manufacturing of crude metals by 30% by 2030. This is very, um, it's quite an aggressive target in the industry for the fact that, uh, well, firstly, it's less than 10 years away. Green iron is still in R&D stage. They've managed to make a kilo, a kilo equivalent in laboratory conditions of green iron um, through Fortescue's R&D labs, but there's still much left to go. I'm also very confident that R&D has an amazing way of having an exponential growth. So I am optimistic in terms of um, the success of Blue Scope Steel in even exceeding this target, but we need to keep it in perspective that as of today's um, manufacturing processes, that is actually quite, a, quite an aggressive target. And speaking of the steel manufacturing, the reason that I find this uh, particular topic quite pertinent is purely because of the fact that globally speaking, green greenhouse gas emissions representative or just from the steel manufacturing industry is 7% globally. If we're talking about um, steel and aluminium manufacturing, that is over 10% of the global greenhouse gas, gas emissions. Um, that is just two metals out of the, the metals that we use day to day. And if you think about just the extent of where we need and we use steel in our day to day lives, driving our cars um, over bridges in our vehicles alone, holding our roofs up above, above our heads, just the computers that we're using, like they're so synonymous with our day-to-day -day lives that the fact that our day-to-day -day lives um, 
And you, you consider I purchase an object. It's a one-off purchase of that. I, I don't consume. I, I don't assume that I'm going to go out tomorrow and purchase another laptop. I assume that I'm going to purchase another laptop in a few years. So you're thinking, oh, yes, I'm not expecting to that my life contributes so much. However, when you consider that you're living and what you, what is surrounding you is literally the cause of 10%, that to me is probably one of the reasons that has sparked me and my passion into delving further into how to improve the sector and, and how to communicate this um, more. So that's just a little bit about where my passion comes from. Uh, why is traditional steel manufacturing such a um, such a big deal because one ton of steel contributes to two tons worth of CO2 equivalent emissions that that is a lot that is in, that is an insane amount um, further to that the amount of uh, fossil fuels required to be consumed and to be generated to continue the manufacturing process is it's one of the highest um, on the planet. Metallurgical coal is extremely important, firstly, because of its strengthening properties. But what we're finding and what R&D is finding is that you can actually continue, continue to have that strengthening process, uh, property that metallurgical coal provides to traditional steel manufacturing, but not by using coal, replacing it. Um, when we look at green steel manufacturing, what we're saying is that one ton of coal has zero tons of CO2 emissions. The, what we do, how do we do that? We do that by electrifying the blast furnaces. Those furnaces are no longer going to be um, powered by coal and by gas. Um, well, instead, we replace them with hydrogen and, hi the, and hydrogen power. Further to that, we can actually use hydrogen in order to strip, to strip the iron ore of its oxygen. And what are the byproducts? If, if you're going to be making steel, there's going to be byproducts in that. Well, the byproduct is water. And that water generally in the R&D space they're trying to reuse that water. So they're trying to you know, precipitate that and recycle it back into the process. I wanna take you to another project that UV um, Australia has been working on. And this is a success story because uh, recently Agnew Gold Mine has been, um, has been used as an exemplar for Good practice of Australian of Australian mines, and um, it, this is a global. This is now being globally published as one of the best examples of how to do it, so to speak. So UV was responsible for the solar and the integration works of uh, Agnew Gold Mine, as you can see. That's the wonderful work of my peers right there, and they are wonderful people to work with, also. And they didn't pay me to say that. Um, so Agnew Renewable Energy Microgrid is, um, was a partially funded arena project. Uh, and the intent of it was to supplement 100% of the um, power requirements of Agnew Gold Mine through a hybrid installation of solar wind and best, uh, best being battery energy storage system. Um, at present, it generates 60% of its power from completely renewables, and the other 40% is through the use of um, thermal gas as its a backup in order to maintain the reliability of its power supply. And what you're seeing in the image there is um, the, the white boxes uh, our battery. Now that's everything I've got to say at the moment. I've included a couple of um, links that are really easy to read. Um, 
and they will just help to further un explain and unpack what I've just gone through today. So thank you for hearing me out today.